Uh, thank you very much for a kind invitation, Manisha Hupesh, and I will try to cover uh, about toxoplasmosis. It's a quite difficult uh, um, issue. It's important to remember the cycle of the parasite, but more important than this is to consider that toxoplasmosis can be a different disease. So you can divide into congenital toxoplasmosis, uh, systemic disease, when you have the acute disease, so we have fever, skin rash, lymphadenopathy, the systemic disease in pregnant women, so you have the risk to congenital toxoplasmosis, uh, also ocular toxoplasmosis, immune competent individual, so the treatment will be different, the diagnosis will be different, um, the ocular toxoplasmosis in pregnant women. So this is another issue have to address. The treatment will be different from uh, immunocompetent individuals. The toxoplasmosis in immunosuppressed individual and the neurotoxoplasmosis. So you can split the the the, the toxoplasmosis in different uh, uh, diseases. So here is the the clinical manifestation of congenital toxoplasmosis with the uh, Sabine triad with hydrocephalus, calcification, and retinal choroiditis. This is a typical uh, lesion in the macula area. And it's really a disaster to see uh, this kind of involvement in the central nervous system and in the macula of both eyes. Uh, this is the siblings with uh, congenital toxo. And what's important to avoid the congenital toxoplasmosis is to detect the acute infection in pregnant women. Uh, so you have the prophylactic measure and regular, regular serology tests. So in France, you, you do this monthly, in Austria, quarterly, and in Brazil, uh, uh, unfortunately have no obligation to do such a, a regular serology tests. So uh, it's important to know that transmission risk of congenital toxins approximately 30%. So how, um, how far the pregnancy is going, so it's, it's the highest uh, risk to get the toxo, but the less risk to have a, a, a devastating uh, infection. So it's important to see that uh, people that's never infected by toxins, there's no risk to have congenital toxin. If you have a chronic infection, so you have a lesion in the eye, a scar in the eye, there's no risk to transmit to the fetus, but you have acute infection during pregnancy or three months before, you have the risk to transmit congenital toxoplasmosis. So the diagnosis of congenital toxin in the fetus is, is based on the PCR in the amniotic flu fluid, or after uh, uh, the born, you can do the IgG or you can follow this IgG gym, GG for uh, a year. I will show here a study um, led by Dr. Vasconcelos in Minas Gerais in Brazil. It's a state that have 21 million people and they try to screen all newborn uh, for uh, congenital toxo and did IgM in dry blood one sample. So they screen 146,000 uh, newborn and have 190 uh, positive uh, kids. And they saw in the ophthalmic and pediatric clinic uh, 178. And they found nine patients with a previous suspicion, 39 with calcification, 10 with microcephalus, and 12 with hydrocephalus. What is important in this study is that uh, they found almost 8% with retinal choroiditis, much more than previous studies published in the literature, and almost 6 free with bilateral disease and 111 with macular uh, disease and 47 with active retinal choroiditis. So you need to treat this patient because of the eye, but not only because of the congenital disease. So here is how to uh, treat the patient with um, congenital toxo. I'm not keeping this uh, slide, but it's important to say that 
all kids with congenital shocks has to be treated for one year with a specific treatment to avoid um, neuro uh, commitment and um, ocular involvement. Uh, talking about ocular toxoplasmosis is quite common in, in Brazil. We have a, a survey from 2010, 2015. We saw 2,972 patients in the National Institute of Infectious Disease and almost 75% uh, were toxoplasmic retinochoroiditis. If you can compare with Australia and Saudi Arabia, we have, you see much more cases of uh, toxo than these other countries. So what's challenges in toxoplasmosis is that all patients ask you the same questions. How did I get this parasite? And this is quite difficult because we know how to get the parasite, but not, don't know how this particular individual get this parasite. So it's very easy when you have um, um, outbreak in a certain region in the country. So you can study this region and get the, the risk factor. For example, in Erechim, as in the southeast of Brazil, you have uh, the, um, they eat a lot of raw meat. So it's quite common to have this. In, Brazil, in, in Rio de Janeiro, it's more common to have um, unfiltered water. So it's very, very difficult to see how one special person get the parasite. Uh, will it affect the other eye? It's quite common to, to, to have this question. Uh, if you think of the transmission of the toxo and how they spread uh, through the body, it's, it's, you should expect it to have uh, uh, the toxoplasm in both eyes. But what we see normally, it's to affect only one eye. Will it relapse? It's quite common to relapse. And that's why we discuss later on, on prophylaxis. And what should I do to avoid relapses? Really, we don't know yet why uh, it relapses. And what we're trying to do now is to do the prophylaxis uh, to avoid relapses. So this was a survey we did in Campos de Rueta Casas in Rio de Janeiro, just to show in this uh, population, uh, the IgG titers is around 90% in poor people and just in the early um, you can see here in this graph as almost 80% in the IgG and when they got older uh, will be around 65% the IgG positive so in in Brazil is it's not very uh, important to have a positive IgG because the majority of the population uh, is positive. So the risk factor for toxoplasma glands in this area is not under cooked beef, but drinking under filtered water at home. So this is another uh, place in Brazil have an outbreak in the 19s showing the water reservoir for a part of the, the city. And there are a lot of cats uh, playing in this area and the half of the, the city was infected by toxoplasmosis. Uh, the diagnosis basically is a clinical diagnosis. The serology can help us more to exclude the diagnosis rather than confirm. If you have a positive IgG, just say that this patient had a contact with the toxoplasma, but not the, the disease is, is a, a, a toxoplasma retinochoroiditis. Diagnostic vitrectomy, we leave only for very difficult cases, and it's important to pay attention to the elderly, elderly, HIV positive, and immunosuppressed patients, that the clinical presentation can be a li li little bit different. Um, one single foci of retinochoroiditis, you can think of a primary ocular toxoplasmosis. This is not common. You see around 10% of the patients with IgM positive uh, following uh, fever, rash, and lymphadenopathy. And usually after treatment, you, have, you can see there's almost no scar where the area of um, the healed lesion. This is the classical uh, uh, toxoplasmosis retinochoroiditis. It's always important to see this uh, uh, hyperpigmented scar to confirm the diagnosis. Usually in Brazil, if you see one case like this, we 
then don't ask for serology and go straight forward for the treatment. You can see here other um, examples of classic active recurrent retinochoroiditis. The presentation is quite different, but you always see this hyperpigmented lesion and uh, area of active necrotizing uh, uh, retinitis. You can see this atypical presentations in, as I mentioned before, in the elderly, HIV positive and immunosuppressed uh, patients. You can have to make the di differential diagnosis of acute retinal necrosis, viral retinitis. So it's important to keep in mind these large areas of retinitis and also um, bilateral disease. Once again, this large area of retinal choroiditis. You don't see much of these cases in, in um, adults, immunocompetent uh, patients. You can see near retinitis uh, also. And to make the diagnosis, as I mentioned to you, is the most important is the clinical picture. But you can use also the goldman Whitmer coefficient and the, poly polymer, uh, the PCR. Uh, it's important that uh, the PCR in toxoplasmosis is not very good. The sensitivity and specificity is not, uh, the sensitivity is not very good. It's very good for uh, viral, but it's not good for um, toxo in the AC. So if you get it more uh, sensitivity, you have to go for the vitreous tab. Another uh, difficult issue is the treatment. Um, there are a lot of, um, studies in the literature trying to say that one antibiotic is better than the other when you have to treat, how you treat the patient with uh, toxo. Uh, the Brazilian EVH society, they um, say that you have to treat the macular and optic nerve lesions uh, with Tignaf vitreous haze, a decrease in visual acute more than three lines and large area of retinitis. I usually treat all my patients with active uh, toxoplasmosis retinochoroiditis independently where on the size of the disease or the visual acuity. Um, prophylaxis is another important issue. You cover this later on. So the treatment, usually they use the what's called the classic um, treatment, the pyramid maintenance sulfadiazine, uh, but there's a lot of alternative treatments, uh, the Bactrin, Clindamycin with pyrimetamine and sulfadiazin, pyrimetamine and azithromycin, azithromycin alone, intravitreous clindamycin, and several studies were done, and no one showed any difference between uh, these um, treatments. Oral steroids, I usually use my uh, uh, do my treatment with oral steroids because I want to clear the vitreous and and uh, try to control very quickly the inflammation to avoid a complication like uh, epiretinal membrane, uh, vitreous detachment, macro hole. I will show you uh, the number of complications we have in, 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 in toxoplasmosis retinochoroiditis, but there's no clinical trying showing the benefit of uh, steroids as a digivent therapy for ocular toxoplasmosis. In a survey did in Brazil, uh, apart from the society, say that you only have to treat large areas, the visual acute, the, the lesion uh, close to the macula and the disc. Uh, the specialists in UVAs in Brazil, almost 70% treat all cases. Uh, and interestingly, uh, you don't see any difference between uh, the, the therapies, sulfadiazine, pyrimetamine, or Bactrin or clindamycin, but the majority of uh, specialists prefer to use the classic a treatment in patients that present with central lesions or the immunosuppressor or uh, acquired in atypical forms. So it's, it's, it's difficult to say that's really no difference. Um, there's no difference between uh, uh, the, the therapy in, in published in the literature, but in practice, they use more the classic uh, treatment when we have more uh, site threatening lesions. Uh, it's important also to say that the risk uh, of side effects is quite high. Uh, 
And we did a, a study with uh, more than 200 cases in, in Brazil, and we have 85 uh, percent present with some um, side effects to the treatment of uh, toxoplasmosis retinochoroiditis. Most of them uh, related to steroids, but it's important to remember that sulfa and pyrimetamine can uh, lead to uh, some systemic side effects. Uh, the prophylaxis is something that we are using more regularly since Felix and, and colleagues published this study in the American Journal uh, showing that the prophylaxis with Bactrin uh, reduces the relapses uh, after three years. And then uh, Felix followed these groups uh, to six year and publish uh, the same results. So we, we are doing prophylaxis for patient that relapses a lot. So we, one patient, for example, that you treat with a specific treatment and just after one month or two and relapses. So we, we present this possibility for prophylaxis. We do a Bactrin every other day for a year or in patient that's only eye or a lesion very close to the, the center of fovea. So we, we, we say that there, there's a possibility to avoid uh, pro, uh, relapses. This is not guaranteed that we uh, work, but uh, there's some data that's a benefit to doing uh, a prophylaxis. Remember, there's a long-term doing back trend. There's a lot of uh, uh, side effects. So we have to discuss with the patient uh, the pros and cons to do the prophylaxis. Um, another important issue that's a lot of people based on one paper published a long time ago, I uh, started to do uh, prophylaxis uh, prior to intraocular procedures. So we decided uh, with Dr. Pavezo to do a, a retrospective study uh, in our patients uh, who underwent uh, ocular surgery and we saw no relapses in 65 patients, only four patients relapsed after three to 17 months, showing that there's no relation between the surgery and the toxoplasmosis relapse. So we decide not to use prophylaxis anymore. And if you think of the number of cataract surgery and the number of patients with a scar in the back, we don't see much uh, relapses in ocular toxoplasmosis following intraocular surgery. And there's a lot of complications you do see in toxo, vascular occlusion, neovascular membranes, retinal detachment, macro hole, aperitive retinal membranes, and visual field defects. And that's why in the majority of patients, we do use steroids to try to avoid uh, vitreous or improve the vitreous inflammation. Uh, in 230 patients with, in the National Institute of Infectious Disease in Brazil, we had 33, almost one, one third of the patients present with ocular complications. And the most common, the residual visual vitreous opacity. And the majority of these patients uh, needs a vitrectomy to clear uh, the vitreous. Epiretinal membrane is quite common to retinal detachment and macro row. These are more uh, uncommon complications. So some uh, examples of uh, vascular occlusion and, and neovascular membrane and visual field defects. This, this patient was very unlucky to have this lesion just very close to the disc and causing this uh, visual defect and a macular hole with this uh, vitreous stretion and led to uh, this macular hole. You can see here, the lesion is not that close to the fovea, but because of the vitreous, uh, the vision dropped a lot. So thank you very much for invitation. I hope I cover a uh, few things